You good, Larry? All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to uh, week two of downstairs, or fresh ground, as it's called. Upstairs, downstairs. Upstairs, downstairs. I guess uh, you are watching, and you're welcome. You're welcome to uh, join along with us on Facebook, and um, notice all the flyers, the, the PDFs there in the in the link. And if you're here with us today, uh, Donald, we're glad you're back. Thanks for coming. Carl, thanks for the flowers. They look great. Just for you. Uh, we are two. We are part two of our David series, and excited to explore a little bit more in video significant portions or, or moments in David's life where he came to that praxis space, that space where the faith, the thing that he is faithful in, is kind of met face to face with his own life, the world at large, and how does he engage? How does he engage his understanding of God in those spaces? So. We have an interesting story to do to, to work with today, and we have new format. So we're glad you're all cozy up next to each other because you're going to be engaging one another and talking. So we're coming, smushing together the discourse groups that we do afterwards with a, with a, with a Sunday morning normal play. So it should be fun. I think last week was a good start. Uh, let me pray for us, and then I'll hand it over to the group. Lord, thank you so much for the gathering that we get to do every week. We pray, God, that you will give us new and interesting perspectives on your word that we will see you anew this week in worship in, in hanging out and talking with one another and getting to know each other Lord may we see you we know we don't have to come to this building to see you but we we love that we can so today we ask in a, in a, in a mighty way you'll not only expose who you are but maybe teach us a little bit something about ourselves we ask for all these things to be done, not in anyone else's name, but yours. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Uh, obviously, a different format. You can sit, stand, nap, dance, clap, raise your hands. Just be free this morning.
never did sick and sore. Jesus ready stands to save you, full of pity, join with
shout it out for the whole room and then we break up into small groups and kind of go at and pray for those things that are out there. So a little bit of this is like uh, got to listen in so that when it's time to pray, uh, we know what it is we're praying for rather than just one person take the list down. Although Carl is in the back with his amazing penmanship. If he, if he forgot what we wrote, he'll, he'll take it then. Then we're going to uh, come together and pray and Carl will close us in a word of prayer at that point. But so let's start. Where where are the prayers and the prayer requests and the praises and the praxis moments that we've been all dying to be a part of in life, and, and how are they going? Anybody have something? Anybody? Oh, did you say something? No? Nothing. All right, Karen. Um, yesterday, I went with another friend of mine. We, there were three of us. We went to see uh, another girlfriend of ours who's in recovery house. And um, we haven't seen her for a while. So it's it's just an answer to prayer because I've been praying for her. And she's sober now. And um, she looked great. And um, I got to just kind of say, you know, Thelma, I'm glad that you're doing so well. I said, see, prayer. Answer, this is an answer to prayer because I've been praying for you. And she said, thank you, Karen. You know, she, she, it's like nice to know that there's a group of us that we all used to hang out together. And like I'm the one that's come to walk with the Lord and yeah. come back to church and stuff like that. So 
it's funny how they'll ask me to pray for them. Yeah. <laughs> and I do, you know, but eventually maybe that's how the Lord uses people. Awesome. Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm just glad John is doing better. Cool. Yeah. Prayer, praise for Sean. Thanks. Anybody else? Practice moments, prayer requests. Yes. <laughs> Today is my sister Andrea's birthday. And I'm birthday. really thankful for the steps that we're seeing in her life right now. She just mm-hmm. started a new job this past week and she just kind of missed the job and we're just praying that God will continue to work in her life and I'm celebrating that we get another deal of her just to That's cool. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Happy birthday to Andrea. And glad you guys are back. Mm-hmm. I missed you last week. <clears throat> Somebody else? Go ahead, sir. Um, I I know that we talk a lot about like practice, like individually, like when we leave here and like what we do like throughout the week. But I know for me, I'm I'd like to pray for like discernment and like understanding of like what practice practice looks like for all of us together mm. as a family. So cool, love that. Anybody else? I want, I want to thank the Lord for the women's prayer group. Um, praise is that Laura found the journal. And the journal is, I don't know how many years old, no but it has all the prayer requests that this group has ever prayed for, both in church and on Wednesday nights. And it's just amazing to see page after page after page one line at a time in a composition book, how God has answered prayer. So very thankful for that. I'm very thankful, too, that um, we had a very specific prayer request on a couple weeks ago that somebody brought up, and it's about praying for families. Um, and we're concentrating on one family a month. We may extend that a little bit, depending on the need. But um, we saw an answer to prayer like the next week that we started this. So I'm really thankful that God is moving. I don't think we're anything special um, as part of a, a group of women that pray, but it's just, um, it's a great time of sharing, and it's, we're, we're going deep, and I'm just really thankful for that. Cool. Yeah, it's a good idea to plug both the men's and the women's prayer groups in case you don't know that we have them. Uh, you're obviously welcome to them. The information's on the back of your sheet there if you want to know more. Anybody else? No? All right. Well, let's uh, group up. Group up in threes and fours and fives and move around a little bit. And uh, you've heard the prayer requests that have come in. And just take some time and take some more. Everybody pray all together at one time. And I think you'll be able to discern through them all. Cool. All right.
Good morning. If you're still praying, continue. I had written something down because I played hooky last week and wasn't here. I didn't know the format had changed. So anyway, um, I hope that you take all these prayer requests with you all week and even pass that time to pray and keep them in your heart and pray for them when you get an opportunity. Again, as I said before, you can do it in the car. You can do it while you're doing the dishes. You can do it while you're cooking. You can do it anywhere you are. So I started writing some things down about prayer time. And uh, when we as a church family unite to pray for those in our family who are dealing with a hardship and need the Lord, the Lord can heal and fix. We don't always speak of the needs we have publicly. Matthew 5, 3 reads, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. To be honest with you, I really didn't know what that meant. But recently I read in a little magazine I get that... Uh, in this passage, Jesus is telling us that it is a blessing to recognize our neediness. When we are poor in spirit, we should reach out and seek the Lord's help and admit that we can't solve life's problems on our own. When we reach out to the Lord, it clears the way for Jesus to stop in and supply what we need and what we never could do on our own. We don't need to have the I can't do I can do it myself attitude. We have to be humble and say, Lord, we need your help. We don't have to be the rugged individual our culture says we need to be. Our Lord is waiting for us to lay our burdens at his feet. Sometimes we don't want others to know, but the Lord already knows. He's waiting. All we have to do is reach out. Don't just bow your heads this morning, but bow them every day. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, it's just three words. Pray without ceasing. So I'll close in prayer. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to come to this church, whether it be in the sanctuary or in the basement, to be together, to hear Jason in your word. 
You've heard all these prayer requests that have been stated today. You know all those that haven't been stated today. We pray, dear Lord, that you've heard them, and we know that you'll move forward. And it'll be your will that's done. We just pray, dear Lord, that we continue to pray, pray to you, knowing that you can do anything that we ask. Dear Lord, bless these requests. Amen. All right, so good that you're in groups and, and kind of stay in those groups um, for this part here. If you want to be more comfortable sitting on the couch, you can move if you want to. Because um, I'm going to be right here behind you. <laughs> right at you. Uh, we took a departure a little bit from our Praxis message series. Some of it, the reason is because the heater's broken upstairs and we came down here and I thought, well, while we're down here, maybe we just kind of do a complete, you know, apple cart upset and try to do everything differently. And um, for those that weren't here last week, I talked a little bit about when I was the National Youth Director, I made a series on the life of David, and it was a video series. And, and it was originally made for high schoolers, um, which I, if you can get a high schooler's attention for longer than five, ten minutes, then you have accomplished much. So I figured you, you all with your great attention spans, no problem, right? Um, but the point of the series was to be able to showcase certain moments in the life of David that he was met face to face with a praxis moment, really. Last week we talked about David and Goliath and the situation of him you know, trying to con confirm for his older brother that he could do this thing and then to go out there and confront Goliath without the, the, the normal armaments that most people would wear and to do things new and different but also to be risky. <laughs> You know, and to, and to put it out there that he might be the one to take Goliath down, which he did. And then how we talked that through, how that was such a, a testimony to the Lord. And, and the, the video last week was a young David, right, running through a, an empty stream, a bed of, uh, with rocks and choosing which rock would you carry if you were going to be throwing one at David, right? Would you, would you discern, would you try to make it large, jagged, pointy, smooth, you know, all that kind of stuff. And that's not probably how it happened, right, in real life. I mean, he probably had stones that he would use all the time. But the point of the film was to say, do we sometimes get caught up in the armaments or, or, or the weapons or, or in, in, our, in our arrows or our slingshots? Do we, do we feel like those are the things that are actually bringing down Goliaths? Or is it our utter dependency on God to do those things? Because whether it's a slingshot, whether it's a computer, whether it's a car, whether it's a job, whether it's a dream, you know, we rely on those things in life. And we make decisions for those things in this life. Similar to running around an empty creek bed trying to figure out which rock should I try to pick up and throw at this thing that's in front of me, right? This Goliath that's there. Might we learn something in the life of David to just ultimately, at the end of the video, it doesn't really matter which rock I choose. It's, it's the one who's guiding it, you know? It's the one who is calling me to this moment. It's the one who will protect me. So I walked away from last week really thinking through which rocks am I trying to pick up and which ones am I discerning? Am I doing this the right way? And I definitely had a week of discernment issues this past week and every time I kind of went to make a decision, I said, yes, that's a, that's a, that's a normal decision to make in this space. Any other person in my position with my, my, my authority or control over the situation might make that same decision that I'm going to make. But is that the one that the Lord would want me to make? And then sometimes I felt like, yes, there's confirmation in my spirit. Yes, I, I can make that decision. I can use this thing. I can throw this rock. And other times it was like, I could, but who would be benefiting? Right? What, what would the outcome be? And, and, and why would I be doing it for that? So today we kind of go... A, Another praxis moment in David's life, um, one that defines him sometimes more often than the defeat of Goliath, and that is the interesting relationship that he had with Bathsheba. So, I mean, I want to, excuse me, I want to throw this out here first, and I want you to kind of get into the mind of David, and you know the story probably well. Uh, we will read it as a group, like we did last week, so we'll have a chance to do that, um, but let's just take a look at 
This video is called The Intent. I should make sure it's loud. So for greater context, um, not want someone in your group to be a reader, and have that person read aloud 2 Samuel chapter 11. Uh, not as long as the last reading, so you can, uh, one person could probably tackle it if you wanted to. Read it aloud, and I would say, actually, because it is a bit shorter, have somebody read it a second time. Okay? <laughs> Your servant, 
the messenger was sent out, and when he arrived, he told David that he would go out and send to him. And the messenger said to David, The men overpowered us and came out against us, and the oak tree and the back to the entrance of the city gate. And then the archers shot arrows at your servants from the Lord, and some of the king's men died. And moreover, your servant Uriah the king. David told the messenger, Say this to Joab, Don't let this upset you. The sword devours one as well as another. Press the attack against the city and destroy it. And say this to the marriage Joab. And when Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. And after the time of mourning was over, David had her brought into his house, and she became his wife, and she bore him a son. But the thing that David had done was to I was trying to bring it up on my phone and I in the spring, at the time when things go on, the man David is at the church of the the they destroyed it and raised But David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around the whole of the house. In the roof of Saul, one of David, the woman who was hiding in the room, David's house, something to find out about her. The man said she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Elias, the son of the king. Then David sent messengers to get her. King David, she came to him and he slept in her room. She was purifying herself and being completely unnoticed. Then she went back home. The woman conceived and had committed to stay. So David sent a letter to Joab. Send me Uriah the Hittite. <laughs> Joab sent him to David. Uriah the Hittite. He moved to his David asked him to the service of David. How Joab was. How the soldiers were. How the soldiers were. When David said to Uriah, go down to your house and watch your feet. So Uriah left the palace and gave them the king and sent after him. Uriah slept at the entrance of the palace of all his master's servants and went down to the palace. David was told Uriah did not go home. So he asked Uriah, why didn't you just come from a military campaign? Why didn't you go home? Uriah said to David, the ark of Israel and Judah are standing in tents, and I commanded Joab that Uriah and the ark. Then David said to him, Stay here one more day, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah the king remained in Jerusalem that day, and the next day, David's invitation to eat and drink with him, and David made him a servant. But in the evening, Uriah went out to sleep on the staff, and the master said, He did not go home to his house. In the morning, Job sent David a full account of the battle. He instructed the messenger, when you have finished getting the king, you the battle, and the king's anger is up, and he may ask you, why did you get so close to the city to fight? Didn't you know yeah, that the Shadow Elves were the wall who killed the Elects and the Heroes? The temptation that they had was to end the Elves' decision in the wall so that he died in the desert. Why did he get so close to the wall? If he asked you this, then say to him, and the Elves would pursue it the wall until they take his death. <laughs> the messenger set out and when he arrived and told David everything Joab has been to God. He wanted to say, the messenger said to David, the men overpowered us and shot their out against us in the open and we drove them back to the enemy. Then the archers shot arrows at your servants from the walls. It's all so that he's going to die. Moreover, he was serving the fire that he died in his day. David told the messenger, say this to Joab, don't let this upset you. The sword devoured you. Press the attack against the city and destroy it. Say this to encourage Joab. 
I'm going to give you just two more minutes to finish reading. So, Jesus wanted to explain something in Matthew 5, something really important that he needed to get across to his disciples and to all of us. And um, it goes a little something like this. It's not really about committing adultery in, in function. It's the actions. It just comes from your heart. That's where all of it starts. It's just a walk upstairs in the back of the castle, right? It's not a castle. It's not really David. I got lucky. It looked like it was, you know, looking over the lands. But, but it was the journey of the heart to get to that space. When the whole world's just looking at the action and, and trying to make sure that the action doesn't actually take place, right? The, the adultery... It'd be nice if it didn't happen because when we look at this, it's like a Netflix series, Samuel, Second Samuel 11, right? Like, all because of a heart choice. Because of the heart choice, somebody was put to death. Because of the the adultery in the heart, somebody's family was destroyed. But what I want you to think through, and the first thing I want you to think through as we walk through some of these scriptures that are, I thought, I tried to pull out some of the ones that are poignant. As we, as we look at this first one, 2 Samuel 11, beginning in verse 1, in the spring at the time when kings normally go off to war, <coughs> which, by the way, David's a king, right? Mm -hmm. <coughs> David sent Joab instead out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites, they besieged Rabba, but David remained in Jerusalem. So they were victorious. David probably knew that it was an easy war to win, but chose to stay back. The journey up the steps begins even here. 
Talk about, in your group, why this is significant, you believe, into the life of, especially in the decision of David and eventually with Bathsheba. Go ahead. All right. So in the spring, and the reason they don't fight in the, in the, in the winter is because the conditions are terrible. <laughs> right? And I will war when it's nice. Right? But um, it's interesting hearing lots of questions and as you're engaging it, and, and one of the things that is in me is, was it a sin for David not to go to war? That's where you guys were just at, yeah, right? I know that. I don't know what people think. Was it a sin for David to not go to war? What, what are some thoughts? And I would say not, I'm not talking about the philosophical stance of war, which could be debated uh, at a great length. Uh, but I'm saying for this particular war, was it a sin for David to choose not to go? What do you think, Salah? I think... Yes, because mainly uh, David's calling was to fight for his nation. 
to win those wars and to go to to war. So God's calling for him is was that and he chose not to do because he thought it's an easy war mm -hmm. and he justified it and he did not go. God was gracious and gave them the victory but yeah. but that was when we don't do what the Lord wants us to do and I've been in this in that place mm -hmm. right when I did not want to do what God is telling me to do that in itself is sin and sin leads to temptation and temptation leads to consequences probably he was not sinning by going to the roof he wanted to enjoy his time and have a fresh air but then here is the enemy preparing the plan and this is how i think of it okay. i don't know i want some of the other corner i want to box this out i want to hear somebody say it absolutely was not a sin go ahead bro oh i mean i'm not there <laughs> like not saying it's absolutely not a sin yeah. but it's when you think about what Jesus talks about what sin is, it's, uh, I see it, any sin is a perversion of God's nature type of thing. So what, him not going to war was not a sin. It's the choice that told him to not go to war. He was being super selfish. And that, that's, how I, that's where I see the sin is. It's the, sin, the sin wasn't him not going to war. It was his selfish choice to not lead the people that God gave him. What would you say if he said, I have an empowered servant, I trust in him completely, and I'm looking to pull this off. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna show Well, well let's just say he's a very powerful man, and if someone's making something boil in the back, it's boiling. Oh. Uh, <laughs> he's a very powerful man, and he is a leader, right? So his leadership would require him to have some level of organization and management, and hierarchy and ladders to climb and deferring to a, a leader to let them experience a war to grow is that a bad thing or is it a good thing or I yeah i think we have enough information <laughs> I, think that, I think Come that on. given the text given sure. the english major like i think you, you don't have enough information in right what was given us to know it it potentially could have been it could have been that david had like cynthia mentioned maybe he's yeah. grown proud. I, I don't need to, like, I don't want to risk myself. This is a small war. Mm -hmm. I, I'm a leader. I need to stay here. Or he could have had an old war injury, and he wasn't, like, he was feeling lousy, and his men said, like, you know what, we got this one. So that we don't know. Yeah. There's not enough to know. I don't think. There is enough in the text to know that he was a bad leader, whether it's this verse or not. Because later, he sends his men to the front for the purpose of assassinating one of them. That's not good leadership. So whether, whether this was the start of it or not, it led to something bad, whether this itself was a bad choice. Did he execute a good plan? I mean, the plan not being loving and kind. Good man. Did he execute a good man. He executed a good plan. I mean, there's a bit of a, you don't get to be a king, you don't get to be a president, you don't get to be a CEO because you're not opportunistic, right? Like, I heard someone once speak on the opportunity that Joseph he grabbed when he ran from Potiphar's wife and how that he knew that would create an opportunity for him and but yet many people out there are just basically only looking at the fact that he was pure right but motives are hard to to to, to guess and to assume sin or no sin yep yeah Hindsight is twenty twenty, and if he could look back and say, "Whoa, I wish I could have done that differently," All right? That's exactly right. If he did go, the chance of him not with this person in particular yeah. would go way, way down of seeing her and, and wanting to be with her. Yep, yeah, Blair. One of the things I don't remember exactly where it's stated, but if my memory is not bad, part of the responsibility of the king was going to the war. Mm -hmm. He, he had, as a king, he had to. Go and be the first in the in the battle, and then lead the battle, whether he fight or not. But he have to be there with the army, and just withdraw with the whole army, not just send them. Yeah. Unless is uh, well, actually this is this is what I remember that he says, but I cannot find it right now. Where where the part of the responsibility of the king was in time of war, be in the war. Yeah. And by the way, what we're doing here, because I don't want anybody to walk away feeling like, oh, we're just making up our own stuff here. We can say whatever we want to say about what the Bible says. 
a little bit of this. And the reason I had you read it out loud and the reason we're trying to augment that with video and conversation is because I don't personally feel like in the church we do enough of this, mm-hmm. yeah. right? We will make it a Bible study and cram it into a corner, and the people that have access to that will do it. But as a whole, the majority of Christianity <laughs> going to church on a Sunday is not engaging with the text. They are simply just like breathing it in, and then they have left to their own devices to process it. I think it's wiser to process amongst people that have read it before and have... But I would encourage you, any of you, if something like this really is like interesting and you want to know how you would know what is behind all this, there is a ton of stuff that you can do in your Bible study, your own personal Bible study, to augment that with different resources and historical resources and extra biblical uh, manuscripts and things like that. So if you get intrigued enough and you want to know, hey, what would I, what could I read alongside of my Bible to help give me some information as I'm reading that would give me some light to it, I'm glad to recommend some stuff for you. So, I have one. Yeah, okay. um, I think uh, as all of us have some kind of a leadership role, whether it be at work or in our home or um, club that we belong to or any of that kind of stuff, for me what stands out to the, in this, and oh, marriage also, if you have a leadership role in your marriage or anything like that, that it is very easy to mail it in mm-hmm. and to just say well it's rolling along it's okay yeah. and i don't have to engage now what i'm not saying that his, his disengagement was sin or not but when things are are going okay and there's no huge bumps in the road it's easy just to let that mechanism keep on going right and that's where i think that if we don't check in with each other in any of our leadership roles, um, even if you're a big sister, or yeah. you know, all those kind of things, if we don't check in with each other, um, we've got we've got a problem, and it shows that we can we can um, fall into something because we mail it in, because we just look at it and say everything's okay. We can just um, not engage in yeah. whatever process. Whatever. Some would say it's lonely at the top. Right, it's lonely at the king level. It's lonely at the CEO level, at the president level. Um, we are not kings <laughs> necessarily, and CEOs in this life. And I can guarantee every single person that I've watched fail in their spiritual journey in a big way, slowly and surely remove themselves from any person that could come into their life and be uh, a help, an agent, you know, uh, used by God, the Spirit of God, to do something. They kind of secluded themselves. And David is able to do that. I mean, not only just like in, in because he's the king, but he can send the entire group away whenever he wants, that he might be alone. So I think it's a good word to say that we do need to be careful. You know, there's a lot to be learned from every bit of this, not just don't take another man's wife and have him killed on the battlefield, right? Like, that's the easy, that's the easy one. That, that's it. There's your major principle out of this chapter. Don't do those things. But that's, the thing is, is it's, what, what we know, what we see, and, 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 the, and the, the salaciousness of the story all begins very simply. It doesn't begin complicated, right? Sin in our life doesn't begin as a complicated factor. It begins normally as a very simple thing that we allow, or we fan the flame, and we, and we, we help it along, so to speak, in this life. And this is David helping it along, so to speak. And looking at the big picture of the whole chapter, there's you can find four or five different places yep. where David had a choice. Yep. And obviously he made wrong choices. You know, what? and what was it, and then Rachel said about, um, you know, this is the man after God's own heart, and what was it that triggered him to make all of these choices not after God's own heart? Right. You know, what, so... Good segue to 2 Samuel 11, 2 to 3. One evening... My video was in the daylight. I didn't have the money budget to film at night. Um, one evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. And David sent someone to find out about her. All right. Uh, keep in mind, this is also a time where it was not customary for one man to have one wife. Okay? That was not customary. In fact, at this time, there, I mean, Solomon ends up having 300 wives right after David, which is interesting. But so 
try to avoid the idea that there would be somebody called into space. That's a, that's a different message, right? That someone would be called in to become another wife of a king. Um, but the nature of what's going on here, discussing your group, what are we, what are we starting to see about David, right? Where we, we might have said, I'm not sure it was such a bad thing that he didn't go to war, it may not be sin. And now this verse comes up and you're like, oh, I'm starting to see a little bit of a pattern here. So chat about what you're seeing here and, and what this does to inform what you know about David.
think that's the same. So the challenge, I think, in this Christian life when it comes to David is I would much rather just have David and Goliath than not David and Bathsheba. <laughs> right? I just love to champion David for his acuity, his his measure of confidence in the Lord and his you know, his reluctance that's not there to go up and just take a giant out of the sky. But this David kind of messes with my theology a little bit. Because God says that this David is a man who is after his very own heart, which I think any one of us, a man or a woman, if that was said of who we are, we could die happy. To know that that's what that person was. Same thing we get with Moses too, right? When we're trying to make him this amazing classical you know, faith figure and just kind of swipe underneath the carpet that he killed somebody. You know what I mean? It's, just, it's hard to do that, right? We have to... We're, in some senses, I heard you use the word justification. You're like, okay, I can justify David until this point, and now I can no longer justify his decision-making process, mm -hmm. right? I totally get that. But that's because that's what we want to do, right? Like, we're trying to find that line of, or, or if you like David, to try to give him the benefit of so many doubts until you just can't do it anymore. Yeah. Um, and, and then how does that affect the way I have to deal with all the Davids around me, right? All the people around me who make amazing choices on days and make really bad choices on other days. And do I disqualify them from being a man or a woman after God's own heart? Like, I can't think of something more disqualifying than what David did in 2 Samuel 11. Okay. I love our group because um, we get so much in here and um, I was a little afraid about this passage here. But um, one was, um, David was, was likely restless mm -hmm. and that he was probably not satisfied with his decision or it could have just been 100 degrees and he wanted to yep. go up there but sometimes I think if we're restless um, maybe there we need to go back and say God were to not make the right turn and follow what you wanted me to do sometimes you're just restless mm -hmm. but it could be a spiritual decision um, another thing that came up was um, maybe this wasn't the first time that David saw Bathsheba mm -hmm. and knew exactly what he was going to find and then the third thing was she had to be much closer than all of us have previously pictured because there's no binoculars, there's right. no anything. So yeah. she was, was likely nighttime. just one building yeah. over. Um, well, nighttime could have been any time after 6 o'clock, so it could have still been light outside, but she was likely in closer proximity than what we had previously pictured. That's so awesome. they're awesome. Great group. points. Group. Yeah, um, it's not customary at this time for people to bathe at night. You know, like we might go take a shower before we go to bed. Not was not the custom then. Um, not all bathrooms or, or bathing places had covered roofs over them. And if you're David and you have the highest point in the land, every night you're going out and looking because it's just beautiful. Like what you're seeing is probably um, like I can't believe I get to see this. You know, and on the way all I can see are people's houses. You know, that's pretty crazy. And then oh wait, I see people in those houses. And okay, <laughs> so whether or not he walked up that step, I would say with intent to see a woman bathing, or whether it was accidental. That's kind of you know what we're all trying to wrestle with in our mind a little bit. Larry? Yeah, I think one of the problems that we have with David in this case is what we think is a man after God's heart. Mm -hmm. Because that doesn't mean that he was perfect. Right. And I have heard people saying, well, yeah, David did that, but he repented right away. Mm -hmm. And he did not. Yeah. So only this, he took, to it took a while because it's not only, it's, it's a messenger going to check with the woman is, it's a time while he have to send people to right. bring Uriah, yep. then send him back, and he repent when the baby was born. Yep. And because he was yep. almost forced to. Yep. So it's not, it doesn't mean that he was perfect. It means that one of the things that David had is he never looked another God but God. But God. Sure. And that made him a God a man after God's own heart. Even though he made poor decisions. Sure. It like definitely. <laughs> Would the church of today have treated David the same way God did? No. No, but what I was going to say in our group, it came up that David 
it seems like David was kind of resting on his laurels. Like, yeah. God brought me here, and now I'm king. And sure. there's nowhere where it says that he asked God, should I go to war? Right. There's nowhere where he's turning to God. And um, one of the things I brought up is we often say, don't forget in the darkness what you learned mm -hmm. in the light, mm -hmm. which is really backwards, because you don't learn anything in the light. Right. <laughs> you learn it. So don't forget in the light when things are going good, yeah. when you're in the promised land, what happened in the darkness in the wilderness, that it was God that brought you through, that God you had to depend on every day, every moment. And it, it kind of looks like David was like, okay, I'm, I got this, you know, and... Um, Restless in the heart, restless legs, <laughs> restless something, definitely prodded him to go up onto the roof. And we can't guess motivation in those spaces, but all of a sudden you're there and you see something. Sin? No, no. When you start coveting, it becomes the sin. Mm -hmm. This is really important for the youth of today because there's not going to be any way, as parents, we can remove all things that we don't want them to see from their lives. It might have been possible 15 years ago before the invention of the phone, right, the smartphone. It might have been possible, but I can tell you now, you know, having my, the kids my, that I have in my age, it's like you can do anything you want to do, but there's still going to be rooftop opportunities mm -hmm. in life. Mm -hmm. The question is then how do we respond to those things that are brought to our attention, right? And I'm not just only talking about the one thing you're thinking about, I'm talking about all things in our lives that are challenging and would distract us, persuade us away from the things of God. Right? That could be a beautiful woman, it could be a really nice paycheck, it could be, you know, you fill in the blank with what you might see from your vantage point that would cause us to really stay focused on that. Carl. Just the thought that it also could be that David started seeing all the power that he had. Mm -hmm. And that replaced, not replaced, but played a part in God gave him all his power. Yep. So he started worshiping the power that he had more so than he worshiped with God. Mm -hmm. I can do anything I want. I'm the king. I can have anybody I want. I can tell anybody to go to war. And I can stay home. Mm -hmm. I have all this power. So I'm not sure that's what happened, but it's thought process. Yeah, whether whether it's a rich in power or rich in money, Jesus would say, man, it's a lot it's a lot easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than it is for that person to get into heaven. So somehow he had managed that well enough to be after God's own heart, right, with all the possessions and opportunity and power that was at his mere fingertips, really. All right, moving on. Enter the most unfortunate character in all the Bible, Uriah who did everything he could to find the woman of his dreams, found her, built a house that now we realize is somewhat close to where David is, so there's got to be a little bit of a hierarchy of his importance, right? And he has worked hard, and he went out to battle, and he would go wherever the king would ask him to go, jump as high, run as fast as he could. And he returns back from battle when the battle seems to be won, and now we can all go and rest, and David is wondering why Bathsheba's husband won't get off his front doorstep. <laughs> Right? Uriah said to David, King, the ark of Israel and Judah are staying in tents, and my commander Joe and my lord's men are camped in the open country. How could I go to my house to eat and drink and make love to my wife? As surely as you live, I will not do such a thing. <laughs> if these aren't like, I mean, you can't make, I mean, you can, I guess, make it up, but this is incredible, right? David probably now, at this point, is, is definitely burning with an understanding of what is going on. Now, he may be, like as we sometimes get in sin, blind to so many things, right? And, and I think we could almost project some blindness onto David at this time because sin had so brought him into a space of not being able to, but maybe this didn't, maybe when he said this, it was just like, oh, you know, like this dagger. Now this guy who, who really, I'm ruining his life, but he's defending me. He, he wants to protect me and he's staying away from the very person that I want. Uh, just, it's, it's almost too ironic. But I guess the point here is when we are in space where we are, the sin of the life has gone from casual to intentional. Right? Because I think this is a journey of sin that goes from casual to intentional and it becomes just like an overwhelming thing in your life and the thing that you have to conquer. And he was probably thinking of 45 different ways to get out of this thing that he may have done or 45 different ways to get into it. 
I want you to talk a little bit about in this space not what happened in your life but in general have you been there have you been in a space where something distracted you from God and you were just completely unable to make the right decisions I mean I don't, I'm not looking for confession time here but I'm looking for us to be real because we get to be real with David how did God work through you to bring you away from that Maybe share a testimony of, we know the kind of the end result here is that, you know, a friend of his had to come, a counselor had to come and, and it caused him to understand that repentance was necessary. But maybe share a little bit about your, because the other part of praxis is falling down and getting up again, right? Understanding that these things will besiege us. They, they will take us over. And, and, and some of us are, are, are capable enough to kind of skirt around them, but some of us walk right into it. So again, not to have a confession time, but was there a time in your life that you were really overwhelmed with, a, with something that was distracting you from God? And, and what did God use in your life to, to bring you to the space where you were brought back around again? If you have it. And you may not have anything to share. It's totally cool. But if you have something on your heart to share, these are things, again, that we don't talk a lot about in the church. So. Um, Because because of David's sin, I'm not going to be a person because that's the one that's over. Yeah. 
Can I just a couple more minutes on this question? Because I think it was very Because I didn't like myself. I couldn't love other plays. And especially with work, I had expectations. I had a blow up with somebody that worked on the show. But then, because I was working for a woman's abuse shelter, I had to go through a training. It was like, these are the characteristics of the so I actually I went back to I had to go back, but it was like something that I didn't I didn't have the clarity, but there was something that I was like God says, okay, they open the door and you can see it. And I had to go back to her. I thanked her for saying that. I said as far as much as that hurt, I enjoyed it. No, of course. How can we? Sometimes it's something like, but that one was. That was Isn't that a plan. dilemma? Even if we had like a small So the first time that the Lord is brought up in this chapter is at the very end. <laughs> Which is interesting, right? The, the accounts of everything we hear, and, and we find out that after the time of mourning was over, the rise time of mourning, David had Bathsheba brought to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. What's interesting to you about, like, about this? There's much that's interesting, but in the space of the Lord being displeased, that's such an interesting space that we don't put the Lord in very often. We look at him as the accountant or the, the, um, the person who's going to assess and decide who's going to be punished and who's going to, be, who's going to prevail. Displeased is, has that feeling of when you displease your parents and you're not going to go to jail for what you did, but man... They really can't believe that you did that, and, yeah. and that that sense, right? Great. Brian, you can say something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, th I think because I mean we all know David as after God's own heart, and I yeah. think it's God knew that too, obviously. Sure. And, and he was just so disappointed that as someone, I mean I don't think he says that about anybody else in the Bible. Mm -hmm. and so David has such a deep understanding of God's grace, His mercy, His forgiveness, and everything. It's almost like God was upset that. David forgot about that about God. Yeah. It's like there are so many opportunities that David could have stopped and said, God, give me your grace, I repent. But he didn't, and mm -hmm. he kept... And I think somewhere along the line, there was shame, and the shame made David keep continuing to make the mistakes because he just wasn't stopping to remember, hey, God's gracious. Mm -hmm. And I think... So I think it's... Yeah, God's disappointed that... David did all those things, but I think I was more so disappointed that he forgot God's nature yeah. in the first place. You know? Good. Yes? Isn't it interesting that God says that um, David is a man after his own heart, and then he goes and does this, and it just It's very interesting. Very interesting. So. Mm -hmm. I don't think... God is ever disappointed in us. He is our creator. 
Um, but it says in the Bible, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And I think displeased here means his heart is grieved. Mm -hmm. He knows that David Gennison, we are all sinners and there is no one good but Christ, mm -hmm. right? And the Bible is clear about this. So I think, and he's our creator, so he knows the wicked side in us and the weaknesses and the mm -hmm. good side to us and that all of us get us in. And sometimes we're going to win over temptation and sometimes we're going to fall in it. Right. Uh, and then we grieve his heart. Mm -hmm. Or even when we want to do our plans and not God's plans, yeah. we grieve his heart. Yeah. But the beauty of it is the remorse. Uh, <laughs> so this griefing God's heart, the only thing that can prevent it is if we love him so much. Like if I love Mesh so much, so I do not want to hurt him mm -hmm. or grieve his heart or, you know, sure. get him disappointed in me. So if I love God so much, I will try my best not to grief my father's heart. Right. You know? the chances are if you're loving God so much, your focus and attention is on that thing yeah. that you love. And then what responsibility do we have in removing or, you know, turning away from other things that we could love, that the world might say to love, that we would be able to focus our attention, right? Other thoughts on this displeased? Or, or in general, anything that you're taking away from this morning's walk through David and Bathsheba story? I just think it's interesting that until the final <laughs> yeah. of this chapter, we think he got away with it. Yeah. Like, yeah. It seems like he executed this plan pretty perfectly. Mm -hmm. he yeah. Managed, even all the little missteps, your yeah. life and so on, blah, 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 gets to kill your eye, In the end, ah, now he has a yeah. wife, she's born yeah. with a son, it seems like everything's going to be fine. Ah, don't forget. Yeah. God saw everything. Yeah. And it just pleased him. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a trade, right? She, he decided to make a trade. I kind of wonder, too, what Joab thought when he gets this instruction from <laughs> yeah. David that says, I want you to put Uriah up front and yep. then pull back and, yeah. and let him be killed. Like, yeah. uh, you know, okay, that's the order from the king, yeah. but... There were a lot of people in that palace that knew what David did, mm. even before mm. Nathan showed up. Mm. Yeah. yeah, he, he didn't pull off he didn't, the perfect plan, the perfect yeah. plan. Yeah. Someone's going to find something out, right? I wonder, I wonder, I um, I, a couple of things. Like I feel a little bit of pity for David as we read through this because if somebody put my thing out for like a group to discuss, like, <laughs> I'll make a Rachel like, series if you want. Oh, I don't want a Rachel series, but but I was also thinking like, I mean, there's no way to know this either. What is David's justification to himself as he's right. doing all these things? Because he's got to be telling right. himself something. I mean, one, he sh he should probably be stoned to death for what he did, and right. Sheba as well. And if she doesn't out him, she's going to get killed when right. her husband comes home. So is he like, oh, well, but i got to protect Bathsheba, and if I just bring Uriah home, she was innocent in this, so yeah. whatever. But then that doesn't work, mm. so okay, now I have to try this, now I'll get him drunk, and then still nobody can find out. And if, and then we mentioned briefly, like, is this God's grace to David? Because mm. if, if Uriah goes home, sleeps with his wife, assumes the baby is his, this sin is still... Yeah. There for There's David. A line. And so what is the what is the outworking right. in David's life if he thinks, Oh, I can do this with with you know, with impunity. I just can have anyone that I want and God never deals with the sin in his mm. heart. Yeah. So this displeasure of God over David's action, David God wants David's heart back. Like mm -hmm. he wants this he wants restitution, he wants this right because I'm certain at this point David does not want much to do with God. Right. right. Like he's got there's this thing just like there is for me or any sure. of us when we have this sin that we're holding on to that we think we've gotten away with but it's still there and so there's like grace to David in all of this and what and there's no way to know this but like what how do I then I started thinking like how do I justify my own sin in my life because look I mean, is there anything I can point to that I can say well I really didn't know that was wrong like right. I, you know I know Nothing. And don't you think that everybody was trying to figure that out with Jesus when they're like, well, I haven't committed adultery yet. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Okay, well, if you've done it in your heart, you, mm -hmm. you the same displeasure that right. my father sits on David now sits on you for what you're doing secretly in a place where nobody knows but you. Right? So 
I mean, the roll down effect of doing that and not being exposed. Think of that. Maybe David didn't have that understanding of what Jesus said in Matthew chapter five, right? Like that comes to us now, and we can pull that away from that. Although the principle, I'm sure, was always you know still very very true. One other thing, we're reading through the Psalms with the girls, and David is really hard on wicked people who think that they can do things and God will never see them. And that's like actually one of the lines. He's like, "The wicked do this," and they say, "God will never see me. His eyes are covered." Yeah. Like, yeah. Back. Mm. Is that really yeah, yeah. <laughs> reading, reading the Psalms of David. Yep, yep. Reading the Psalms of David, finding out his life. Like this is something that I hope spurs us on a little bit. Like you could take some time this week and really kind of extrapolate from this. So one second, one second, Larry, you're up. Yeah, I, I think that is pretty much for us to know when we don't do what the Lord wants, what we make feel the Lord, mm -hmm. because in this case. David isn't aware of it. It's, that is not a, it's not something that David is knowing. Right. That is for us. At this point, David just have the wife. They, they, David only have the woman. Yeah. He doesn't know what the Lord is feeling. He yeah. doesn't know that part. So this, I believe, that is very much for us. That Commentary. we can realize how much the Lord loves us and how much we can hurt him by not doing what he's calling us to do. And just a, a warning be, that take take very careful what we decide because That's that right. can bring us to a series of complications. Uh, that is in my mind what happened mm. with David. He wasn't not he was not intended to kill Raya at in the beginning. Right. He was trying to cover it. Let's say how I can Sure. Kind of save these. Yeah. Mm. But it just, Uriah was so committed to God, to him, to to his responsibilities that, yeah, well, there's no way for me to fix this. Right. Unless I kill him. Mm. So that that feeling that his actions cause in the Lord is what we have to pay attention to. Mm. Do it's not good. do that because the Lord will be this place for you. It will be sad because what we have done. Yeah, people might get confused and think that the displeasure is only just what he did with Bathsheba, but there's probably 35 instances of <laughs> displeasure-worthy stuff that's in this chapter that when we look at it, we see that it's not just all about, like it wasn't just about the rock hitting Goliath. So therefore, it's not just about the taking a mother woman, a man's wife when seeing her bathing on the roof. So... I'm going to go to this table for last uh, comments, and you guys, if you guys want to come on up, feel free to get started there. She might have, she might have been a bit more innocent, saying, "Oh, this is a perfect time for her to do what I'm going to do." Yeah, it's possible. Kim, you good? Uh, I just. That's okay. She's good. She's good. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you for engaging in the conversation about a potentially interesting topic. Um, but I think that we can, there's enough in the space of scripture that allows breath and life and, and, and dialogue. And that's my hope is that, you know, this, this four part series on the life of David would kind of spur us on to, man, I wish I knew more about that. Like that would be so cool if I could figure that out. And believe me, there is a lot to know. There is, and my encouragement to you is in those praxis spaces, <laughs> again, the more you know about scripture and, and what God wants from us, right, the more you understand his word, the greater the, the moment of praxis that you'll be able to engage in, right? Like if you only think that the Bible's all about feeding people that are poor and hungry and lonely, then that's probably what you're gonna do in those moments. You're gonna feel like that was a God moment. But you can have praxis moments, honestly, not all, not all good. <laughs> Right? They can be hard, and, and we can mess up, and that's still praxis. Right? Our faith in that space still exists. It's just a matter of what does it do. Like when Nathaniel comes, and when Nathan comes and, and does cry for him to rebuke, you know, and excuse me, rebuked him and cries for repentance, he did. Right? So that's praxis. We need to be open for stuff like that. We need to not abuse power. We need to make sure we're not blind to areas of, because of the sin in our life. And we need to have people around us that can do those very things so that we don't take the long journey upstairs to get to what we shouldn't be getting to in the first place. So, 
Let me pray for us, and then we're going to close in some worship. Lord, we just want to um, not end this dialogue, I guess. May this be an ongoing, running sentence in our life of wanting to explore you more in spaces like this. And as was already mentioned, not one of us in this room, not one, has no idea what it's like to... <laughs> not have these experiences against you. We have all fallen short of your glory. We have all taken the walk up the ladder, up the steps to some capacity or another. And you have been gracious with us. Just like you were gracious with David, you've been gracious with us. And for that, we are a thankful people. I know even God in my own personal life areas that I know without your grace, I would have disqualified myself a long time ago. And so I thank you that you came in and shone brighter than my shame. I thank you, Lord, that you came in and disproved what the world would say about me to tell me what you believe about me. And when I thought I had the answers, when I thought I had everything under control, and it crashed and burned, you were there. Thank you for that, Lord. And I pray that that's the same sentiment, the same story for all of us here, that when these things happen in our lives, we see you. Thank you, God, for the life of David, for the story of this week. And may we grow abundantly in our knowledge of you. In your name we pray.
either online or in person. Uh, blessings and peace as you go on your day. Amen. Amen. Thank you.